The sea is a swirl, the wind is up, and so are tempers. They're both after the same thing. One of the best and most valuable stakes that Neptune himself can put on the table. The giant of the North Atlantic, Bluefin Tuna. You could roast some fruits, some pears, say, would be really nice. Our chef is Stan Frankenthaler, who became famous at Salamander Restaurant in Boston. Known for the fusion tastes he creates, Frankenthaler is also celebrated for his intelligent approach to presentation, as well as conservation of resources. Known for his opposition to overfishing and for his desire to connect with the farmers and the fisher folk. Thus it is that Chef Stan is out of the kitchen today at the dock in Sandwich, Massachusetts, joining an expedition for the giant bluefin tuna. It is, they say, the most sought after fish in the sea. A harpooning adventure. Harpooning, not because it is archaic, but because it makes more ecological sense, is selective, not wasteful. Chef Stan is selective too at the Ward family farm in Southern Massachusetts. Jim Ward was a boy when his late father put 7,000 blueberry plants in the ground. For many years then, the harvest has been as abundant as it is clean. Did you start off as a berry farm? We did. My father was retiring and planted 7,000 blueberry bushes. And, That's quite a commitment. <laughs> yeah, those bushes dragged uh, my brother and I into this business. So these are over 20 years old? That's right. My father died right after he planted these bushes. We took it upon ourselves to try to improve it and to preserve it. How many varieties do you have here? We have 10 varieties. And uh, we, have, we, we do that in order to stretch our season from early July into the middle of September. So oh. we have a variety if you were. So you'll be picking for a couple of months. That's right. Birds willing. Birds <laughs> willing to share. You always have to share. <laughs> So what variety do we have here? This variety is called Spartan, and my dad loved Ooh. this one. Look at the size that they get. Those are beauties. They're enormous, and they're really good tasting, too. They're very sweet. I have a, we have a picture we, my family kind of cherishes of my dad holding these in his hand with the quarters underneath, and it's obscuring the quarters. Uh, mm. These aren't quite that size, but they're uh, Those are delicious. I'm going with your dad on these. These are excellent. The juice of these are really, really what you would think of a blueberry should be. The flavor and the tenderness of this berry to me says, you know, this would be a beautiful sorbet or something frozen oh, wow. like that where you'd really be showing off the blueberry. Don't mind me, I just can't stop picking them when I see them on there like that. That's I can't stuff. stop eating them, so. <laughs> Is it the berries that you love? I love growing any crops that make people really excited. This is why I enjoy selling to chefs too, because there's no, no group more passionate about this food and this locally produced food than, than you guys. Well, it, it seems that as closely as we're connected with the food, it seems we're connected in that, in that spirit too of being still the basket holders, you know, of flavor and variety and heritage and taste and you know like we've been talking about there's nothing that's better than those blueberries picking them people don't experience that enough let's have more blueberries <laughs> i didn't really uh, i've been looking at this one <laughs> as he seeks out the best in blueberries chef stan also looks for quality fish good wholesome fish of great value Frankenthaler is by the sea in New England, early fishing capital of the New World. His passion is for freshness. This chef was one of the first in the country to remove threatened species from his menu because he saw ever smaller fish arriving at the door and knew there were too many boats, too many nets. Before the sun breaks over the bow, Billy Chapralis, Billy Bluefin as they call him, and Kevin, his mate, his wheelman, getting their gear ready to go after the bluefin, the largest of the bony fish, the most elusive and expensive catch in the sea. It's the love to do it, and it's the hunt, and it's 
just you with the fish. And as you get one throw, if you don't if you don't get the fish, that's that's it. Now you've got to go find another bunch. Lots of times you don't get another chance. Billy too knows that the nets haul in everything. Dolphins and turtles and too many fish, too many tuna, wreaking havoc on the water world below. You see him where the birds are? For 35 years, Captain Billy has been hunting the bluefin one at a time with a harpoon. The visions of the two, chef and fisherman, are an overlay. Find and serve the best and save the rest. You're working on quality as much as you can. And you go up on a school of bluefin and you're basically just taking one fish out of the school instead of taking several out or the other methods that are being used. And it's be one on one and being able to come up with that kind of a product that you can take pride in it. You just, you just get into it and you get going. Yeah, exactly. You make that scramble pretty quick there, huh? <laughs> Captain Billy's not used to this, having aboard a city fella. In time, the two warm to one another, as Billy is old salt to the landlubber. The harpoon's 12 and a half feet long. Schedule 80 aluminum. About how much does it weigh about? Oh, about probably 10 pounds. And it's about a 10 inch shank, aluminum shank, that that goes into. I'm gonna bring it back into a strap that holds the line. Okay, I see. Do you have uh, different darts that you like to use on, no, on different it. days? That's the, or dart. that's the dart that we that's use. That's the tuna dart. And I'll set it up. Protruding 20 feet from the bow is a sort of seafarer's balance beam, the slender path to the pulpit. Can I come out there with you? Yeah. I'll let you try it. I'll come down. Uh, I'll just go right around you. You just put it in that saddle. Yep. Like that. It lays in like that. So when you take it off. Yep. You're ready to go. All right. Yeah. So you're leaning in. Right. You put your foot on this kickstand. Mm-hmm. Okay. Foot a little more forward. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's really actually kind of light, isn't it? The harpoon. Well, get it out there. That's tricky. Lean right into the belly rail. Point it straight ahead. There you go. Okay. And lift it up. Lift it up. Get your hand up. It's like throwing a baseball. Uh huh. It's one an overhand, so your your arm goes right. Right down. Yeah, and it goes over like the side of your head, like this, at least it's so. Yeah. How far are you away typically from a fish? Between 15 and 20 feet. When you're holding it like this and it's out there, you got some, you got some weight you're trying to balance. Put your left hand out more, so spread it out. There you go. There you go. Oh, okay, yeah, right. And the tip up like that, that part yeah, of the... Yeah, well, you uh, want this up a little bit more. Oh, yeah. There you go. When you, you're coming on those fish and you don't want to really raise that harpoon until you, you're almost within range and getting ready to throw. We don't really quite have anything quite this, uh, quite this long in the kitchen. The only thing close you got there is a shish kebab skewer, right? Yeah, I mean, that's right. That's well, it's it, right? great. I mean, in so many ways, it's still the same tool that's always been used. Yes. Yeah. You're out there looking for, hunting for a wild creature. As we head out of the harbor here, Captain, tell me what, what are we looking at? Where are we heading? Well, we're coming out of Province Sound Harbor, and we're going to be going to the northeast, probably about 30, 40 miles offshore. Uh -huh. Out to Wilkinson Basin. Wil Wilkinson Basin, yeah. It's a good spot. Well, that's what we're going to try today, give it a shot, okay. see what we can do. What depth of water are we going to be in? When That'll we're be out in about a 100, 100 fathoms of water. So what will the uh, tuna be feeding on out there? Blues or? No, they'll be feeding on uh, shrimp, uh -huh. mackerel, heron, and closer to shore in that area of sand eels. 30 feet above the water is Billy's mate Kevin looking for signs of tuna. Birds congregating, whales surfacing, a patch of water so smooth it could be taken for oil, a slick, they call it. All of them indicators that the tuna are close by. Getting close, Captain Billy then uses his nose. He can smell something sweet. He likens it to the scent of watermelon. You see him where the birds are? Okay. 
He is poised to throw. The boat is bouncing in the waves. The breeze is in his face. The target is swimming faster than a horse can gallop, 50 miles an hour or more. Back it up again. Okay, good, good, good. The bluefin, so large, as much as 1,200 pounds, is fast, streamlined, a body built like a torpedo. Harpooners miss most of the time. Today, it's a medium large, not a giant, but a good catch. The beautiful blue stripe, found only on the bluefin, glows in the afternoon light. When I get down there and off the, on the pulpit, you really get excited. And it's the same thing with being a chef. Every piece of fish, you got to get excited about. This is something that you are going to create. It, it's, to me, it, it's, it's that complete circle, seeing where food comes from and how it comes to us. It's just about slicing that tuna and eating it just like that. Billy Chapralis is blessed. One of those good days, the fish is in the boat. The skipper is tired, but he's a winner today. And he is unconfined. No traffic jam, no office cubicle holds him. He catches fish. Captain Billy was the best. Uh, I mean, it's a rare opportunity, I think, to get on a commercial boat like that. That was, that was an amazing day. We've been very active within the fishing community. We like to have a nice representation of locally caught fish and shellfish on our menu. This is gonna be a really delicious piece of tuna. This would be essentially a quarter filet. This has a really beautiful eye, a beautiful color. You can see it has a great swirl. It's nice and tight. And this would be a great fish for eating raw, also for staking, cutting into nice thick slabs that you would uh, put on a hot grill, or if you wanted to, you could cook that in a really hot pan. For the first course, I'm gonna make a salad of farm veggies with slices of raw tuna and a green goddess dressing. These are little lettuces that I picked from uh, mine and Chloe's garden this morning. We've lightly pickled these baby beets that came from the farm with just a little bit of rice vinegar and ginger. And this will add a very nice color to our plate. So these are some red chieftain potatoes. These are nice small potato that has a little bit of a little bit of waxiness to it. Makes it a good potato for a salad. And I'm just going to add a few wedges of tomato to the plate. Tomatoes and green goddess are especially good together. I have some fresh cucumbers. And a couple of different beans. We have some uh, the yellow wax beans as well as some green beans. These we just blanched in a little bit of lightly salted water. Still crispy. The color is very intensified. The green goddess is a great dressing. It's really one of my favorites. In fact, I, I feel like I'm on a, a mission to uh, bring green goddess back to everybody's life. They don't even know what they've been missing. The Green Goddess is a creamy herbal dressing. It's a puree of scallions and parsley, tarragon, garlic, sour cream. It's tangy, it's delicious. I'm gonna slice some tuna for us. Probably no more than a quarter inch thick, but I don't want it to be paper thin either. To really get the nice flavor and texture of the tuna, it needs to be uh, a little bit more than paper thin, and I'm gonna arrange that over the lettuces. We wouldn't be able to serve the tuna raw like this if we weren't really sure of its source and its origin, how many days the tuna had been out of the water. And what you'll taste when you eat this is sweetness, a richness from the fattiness of this tuna. You'll taste kind of a clean brininess of the sea. And those are all attributes that you really want in all fish, but especially if you're gonna serve fish raw like this. We have a little first of the season corn and I'm just gonna sprinkle some corn kernels over. And to finish the plate, I wanna season with a little bit of kosher salt and a little freshly ground black pepper. And we're ready to serve this dish. 
Well, for the entree, I thought that we should do a grilled tuna steak. And it's important to have a thick cut on the tuna steak so that you can sear all sides well on the grill and still keep that nice medium rare streak across the center. Oil the fish on the side and just use a neutral vegetable oil, safflower oil or corn oil. Season well with kosher salt and cracked pepper, but we're gonna have a very savory sauce for this dish, so we're gonna keep the tuna itself rather straightforward. So we've got a charcoal fire burning in here and the grill is very hot. I'm gonna lay the tuna steaks right on. And now the idea is that just let them sit and sear. Don't wanna move them around too much. So we're going to uh, grill some squashes as well. And we've partially roasted these squashes in advance. And at the same time, I'll go back and turn our tuna. To get those nice grill marks, I just wanna change the direction of the tuna on the grill, but we're gonna keep it on that same side. So while these are cooking, I'm gonna make our sauce. This is gonna be an interesting sauce. I'm gonna heat my saute pan. I'm gonna mince a little bit of ginger. This is fresh ginger root. We tend to describe this as a hand of ginger. And I'm gonna take one of the fingers off. The fibrous nature of the ginger root runs up the fingers of the ginger as it grows. So we're gonna to try to use that to our advantage. Take one piece of ginger, trim it, kind of square it off a bit. That'll make it nice and stable on the cutting board. I'm gonna slice the ginger into nice thin slices with the grain. And I'm gonna cut these into little thin matchsticks, little julienne, and then I'm gonna mince them, cut them into a very small dice. And you can see it, very quick, very easy, nice, fresh, and fragrant. We're gonna turn our attention back to the tuna steaks here and flip them over. You can see they're starting to get a nice char. Probably gonna be able to move our squashes to a little cooler part of the grill. And to the pan, I'm gonna add a little sesame oil and a little butter. Start melting that in this hot saute pan. And as that's heating up, I'm gonna add some of our minced ginger and some garlic and some lemongrass. And I wanna see these ingredients caramelize a little bit. I want them to, to brown just a little bit, the way that you would say brown onions. Oftentimes we think of uh, caramel as something that's wonderful in a sweet dish or a caramel sauce or ice cream, but when you brown vegetables, you're caramelizing those natural sugars, and those are wonderful flavors. They add a real nice depth of character to a dish or a sauce. I have some chopped peanuts that I'm gonna sprinkle into, and I'm gonna brown these in the butter and sesame oil with the garlic, ginger, and lemongrass. Once you add the peanuts, you wanna keep a fairly close eye on the sauce. So you wanna add one of your liquids to slow things down, and I'm gonna stop that cooking by adding a little of the rice vinegar, a little soy sauce, and I'm gonna pull it off of the heat. I've got some fish sauce. and some lime juice. And we're gonna finish this sauce with some fresh Thai basil and some fresh cilantro. So we've got this very savory peanut sauce with caramelized garlic and ginger. This tuna dish is gonna be accompanied by some curried rice noodles that we can serve as a uh, salad. The rice noodles are wonderful and really take to a lot of different flavors. Uh, we have some sweet peppers in here and some cilantro leaves, some little pea sprouts. I have the tuna off the grill and I'm gonna take all of our little squashes off as well. 
want to arrange our squashes. We yeah, kind of sometimes like to put that patty pan back together there and get that really nice thick tuna steak. When we received our squash from the farm, we had the blossoms too, so I've just sauteed these. I just want to pour that all over the tuna, sprinkle some onto the squashes, and let some of that sauce fall onto the noodles, and a few sprigs of herbs. And I like the looks of this dish. For dessert, I wanted to make a very simple blueberry dish. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make some warm ginger blueberries that we're gonna put over coconut ice cream. And I'm gonna start with a uh, hot saute pan. This time I have a bigger pan because what I really wanna do is I just wanna warm those berries. I don't wanna burst them or turn them into jam or anything. So I have sugar that I'm gonna to allow to caramelize on the bottom of the pan. I have some julienne ginger and some sweet butter. And I have a little bit of mirin. Now this is sort of an interesting ingredient to the dish. Mirin is a sweetened rice wine. So we've got that little bit of um, acidic quality that we might wanna have to balance the caramel. We've got some natural sweetness. Now that that's caramelized, I'm gonna add some julienne ginger. and some butter, and a little splash of mirin. Lift the pan up and tip it away from you and splash in the mirin. Got some nice blueberries that we picked down at the Ward's farm with Jim. Gonna warm these through. I want to keep these moving around. I'm going to toss the blueberries in that nice gingery syrup. We want to warm them through until they're tender and just about ready to burst. This is some nice homemade coconut ice cream. And uh, I've got some nice homemade cookies. I'm going to spoon these warm berries onto the ice cream. Got some ginger cookie and a little coconut cookie here and just a nice vanilla and chocolate swirl that we can garnish with. Everybody loves cookies and ice cream after all. Some delicious blueberries and we're ready to go. When you cook locally, you really cook seasonally. And knowing the people who grow the food that you cook with or catch the fish, you know what they're about. And they're very passionate people. And they're really taking care of those raw ingredients that come into the kitchen.